Good afternoon. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, I see folks are still joining us. And we have so much to chat about today that we just want to get started and be really timely. Thank you for joining us. We are the Autism and Developmental Disabilities SIG of ABCT. Um, and we hope that there are lots of new folks in the audience who are new to us, and we would love to share more about um, what our mission is and hope that you take this opportunity to learn more about us today. Um, our mission includes conducting research, clinical, and advocacy work that is aligned with the priorities of autistic people. Um, and for us, specifically, this means including autistic people from the very start of research projects and creating new interventions. We also prioritize the use of inclusive and narrow affirming language. And you can use, uh, you can learn more about our mission on our website. In case you wanna find out more about us, you can use this QR code to join our listserv. You can find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, and our website is on the slide as well. We have an exciting, uh, soon to be announced seminar coming up in a, a few months. Our diversity committee is gonna be putting on this seminar for the first time. Um, so stay tuned for that. And then we're also really excited for our pre-conference offerings in Philadelphia, right around the time of the convention. So you can mark your calendars for Thursday, November 14th, and the actual convention will be the 15th through the 17th. So please save the date for Thursday in the afternoon in Philly, and it will be in person this year, which is a change from the past couple of years. And finally, we are still accepting applications for our new secretary and treasurer positions through April 1st. I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Allison Rado for the introduction of our speakers. Thank you so much. We are excited today to welcome Kelsey Dixon and Micah P. Sorkia. Kelsey is an associate professor at San Diego State University and a research scientist at the Child and Adolescent Services Research Center. As an implementation scientist, her work focuses on improving the translation and implementation of evidence-based behavioral and implementations interventions in community settings, with a particular focus on improving autism services. Her work also aims to improve equity and access to quality care for underserved or underrepresented populations and utilizes a community engagement approach to do so. She is also a clinical psychologist with experience serving youth with a variety of developmental and mental health conditions and in training providers of autistic youth across multiple age ranges and foci. Micah P. Sarkia is a multiply disabled community organizer, research and researcher, and educator from Louisville, Kentucky. Micah is nearing a decade of service in the disability community and has experience working with other disabled folks across the lifespan in a wide variety of roles and settings at the local, state, and national levels, from the classroom to the community to the health. They are a founding member of the Kentuckiana Autistic Spectrum Alliance, a peer support and social group by and for neurodivergent adults serving Central Kentucky and Southern Indiana. Today, they work at the National Center for START Services, located at the University of New Hampshire, where they serve as a co-investigator of a BACORI-funded telehealth study and contribute to NCSS training and programming to uplift self-advocate voices and experiences. Micah's professional interests include participatory research, peer mentoring, and other forms of popular education, and the intersections between disability, systemic experiences of oppression or marginalization, and trauma. Micah also holds a bachelor's degree in integrative studies with concentrations in organizational leadership, social justice, and psychology from Northern Kentucky University. We're excited to welcome both our speakers today. So without further ado, we're going to hand it over to them for the presentation, discussion, and follow up with Q&A. Thank you all so much. Well, I'm delighted to be here today to be talking about mental health interventions for autism. And so I first just want to start by um, saying thank you to the Autism and Develop, um, Developmental Disability SIG and the broader ABCT for facilitating this discussion. Um, and in particular, thank you to Micah for joining us and co-presenting and providing some really valuable uh, insights into this particular area. 
And then a quick note um, that was alluded to at the beginning in the introduction of this talk, that there's a really rich and important discussion around the use of language within the context of neurodiversity and autism. Um, and for this presentation, I'm choosing to use identity first uh, language as this is kind of the preference among those with whom I work and collaborate with. Um, and so just wanted to kind of put that note there. And for those of you who are interested in learning more, um, there's a really um, a relevant paper um, led by Kristen Matama Patel that um, I would refer to for you to to kind of to begin to learn a little bit more about this. So for today's agenda, um, I kind of first want to start by talking about what we know in terms of mental health interventions for autism because this is an area where uh, there's been significant work over the last couple of decades and 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 thanks to the work of many people on this call and and outside of this, we have um, some really significant areas of advancement in terms of mental health adventure for autism. And then I wanna talk about where we are or where I really think we should be going um, in this field, and then hopefully leave um, a, a large amount of time for discussion uh, and to hear from Micah. So what do we know about mental health interventions for autism? Um, I mean, first and, and foremost, we know that there's a really high relevance and need for both mental health services and mental health intervention. Um, and this is really evidenced by the fact that um, a large majority of autistic individuals experience co-occurring mental health conditions. So for example, anywhere from 30 to 70% of autistic youth experience a co-occurring mental health condition compared to 25% of non-autistic individuals. And it's um, important to know that it's not just kind of one co-occurring mental health condition that tends to be present and um, data suggests that in fact, multiple co-occurring mental health um, conditions with a, a kind of an average or mean of three um, tend to, to be present amongst those who present for mental health services. So as a result, mental health services is a primary service setting for autistic individuals. Um, and there's been some data to suggest that um, autistic youth in particular comprise as much as 20% of community mental health providers' caseloads. So it really points to the significant need um, to focus and think about mental health services and mental health interventions for autism. As a result, um, there's been um, a really significant prioritization of mental health and autism. Um, I think both there's been a prioritization among autistic individuals or autistic stakeholders, as you can kind of see here in some of the really important work detailing um, the needs or where research or um, a lot of the, the field should be going um, that have been led by Thomas Frazier and Elizabeth Pelicano. But there's also, you know, fortunately been prioritization nationally from national organization and funders, including the Interagency Autism Coordinated Committee um, that has held kind of large national workshops and um, forums around this idea of mental health and autism and really trying to understand and, and prioritize and figure out what's needed. And this has really resulted in significant advances in mental health interventions for autism, as well as a growing evidence base. Um, as you can see here on the left, um, this is an image from some work led by Susan White and colleagues that really demonstrates that um, over the last um, three or so decades, there's been almost a 30 fold increase in articles focused on psychosocial or mental health interventions for autism. And their work particularly focused on autism and depression, um, but it really just points to this fact that within the last 30 or so years, this has really become a very um, prioritized and, and large area for research. And then has resulted in um, numerous recent reviews kind of detailing and, and specifying um, what kind of interventions exist, the evidence base for them, et cetera. And this includes um, some work that I led where we really kind of took a step back and, um, and thought about and characterized the types of interventions that have been either adapted or developed, as well as you know, what kind of changes or adaptations have been made to make these interventions relevant for autism. Um, and then what do we know about their use in community settings? And so that'll be a lot of um, what we use to guide some of the um, discussion that I'm leading today. So what do we know about mental health inter interventions for autism? We know that there kind of tends to be two different types of intervention. Those that are existing interventions that have been specifically adapted for use in, with autism. Um, and this includes, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy that you know, we've um, adapted or modified um, to be more uh, a better fit or more relevant for autistic individuals. But there is a large number of interventions, mental health interventions that were specifically developed for use with autism. Um, and these largely consist of kind of multifaceted or multi-component interventions that um, include a lot of evidence-based strategies that have been packaged 
um, for delivery uh, with autistic individuals. Across these two types, however, um, the majority or, of, of these interventions um, kind of tend to target one specific co-occurring condition. So things like autism or, or excuse me, things like anxiety or depression um, that is um, common uh, in autism. So in terms of the specific types of interventions, just to give you a little bit of a better sense of what they are, um, in terms of uh, both across adults and youth, the majority of mental health interventions for autism tend to be cognitive behavioral in nature, um, or, um, and, and this includes things like facing your fears, which was developed by uh, Judy Rubin and colleagues in Colorado, or the behavioral intervention for anxiety in children with autism developed by Jeff Wood at UCLA. For adults, um, there's also been a um, pretty significant focus on um, acceptance commitment therapy or some mindfulness-based interventions, including mindfulness-based cognitive therapy or mindfulness-based stress reduction. For youth, in contrast, um, you know, in addition to CBT, there's been a lot of focus on behavioral interventions, including behavioral parent training. Um, and kind of uh, some examples of this, there's a, um, an individualized mental health intervention for autism or AIM High that was developed and tested by Lauren Brookman for the UC San Diego. Um, the research units in behavioral interventions or the Ruby interventions led by Karen Beers and Eric Buter. Then there's been a significant amount of focus on um, some of those behavioral parent training programs like parent-child interaction therapy or the positive parenting program or triple P. Um, and then I think uh, um, there has been, although to a lesser extent, um, some work really focused on uh, developing or adapting mindfulness-based intervention for autistic youth. And this includes things like my mind. Regardless of the type of intervention, if it was adapted or um, specifically developed for, for autism, um, there are some really common um, considerations that have been incorporated um, to enhance the use of these interventions with autistic individuals, right? And our work really sought to characterize what these adaptations or modifications or considerations um, look like. And by and large, one of the primary um, considerations or adaptation areas to really um, um, for use with autism is the um, addition of additional elements. So things like adding caregiver involvement or caregiver directed strategies, um, the increased use of visuals. So trying to kind of, um, I think in both, um, use visuals as the primary way of interacting with patients, but also um, visuals that correspond to a lot of the kind of verbal aspects of many of these treatments. Incorporation of particular interests of the autistic um, individual that's kind of receiving the intervention. Incre increasing the session structure so that it's a little bit more kind of consistent across sessions and predictable, as well as the inclusion of a lot of psychoeducation. Um, and this, in, in many instances, includes a lot of psychoeducation education around what is autism, as well as other important areas that are relevant within the mental health context. There's also been a lot of emphasis on adjusting the pacing and increasing, increasing opportunities for repetition um, uh, within these interventions, or um, a lot of considerations around how to tailor the intervention elements um, to really fit the, the individual that is, is receiving the intervention. This includes using more concrete language or less emphasis on verbal that I kind of alluded to. Um, adjusting how the intervention is delivered and the strategies used based on both individual, but the broader um, individual or the broader family's functioning. And this includes consideration of the strengths of that individual as well as um, any challenges that they may be encountering. And then lastly, um, another very common consideration or kind of adaptation that is made is adding other approaches to the um, cognitive behavioral intervention, for example. So this um, by and large consists of adding a lot of um, modules or strategies that target things like social skills. Across the board, our work really suggests that um, the main goal of these considerations or these adaptations um, is to really enhance the engagement and resulting effectiveness of these interventions with autistic individuals, right? To try to make them more engaged in the therapeutic process so that you know, we can see stronger effects of these interventions. And I think this is really important because there's been some really neat um, recent work coming out um, of UCLA led by Jeff Wood that suggests 
that the that in, the inclusion of these adaptations or considerations are critical for really enhancing the effectiveness. And in fact, um, there was a recent study that they led um, focused where they um, compared um, a CBT that was specifically adapted for autism compared to kind of your traditional CBT um, intervention and services as usual. And the results really suggested that um, CBT that was very thoughtfully and specifically adapted for use with autistic individuals outperformed both traditional CBT and care as usual. It's then important to note that um, kind of traditional CBT was, uh, did outperform care as usual, but it was really this CBT that was thoughtfully adapted for use with this particular population that uh, was shown to be the most effective, right? So it really underscores this idea that um, considering the needs of these ind of the individuals that are being served um, and incorporating those needs and specific um, adaptations into the del delivery of the interventions is really important. In addition to the development of several mental health interventions, there's been you know some additional advances in terms of um, uh, the services and implementation research um, surrounding the delivery of these in community settings. And so, you know, um, this includes the development and testing of um, what are referred to as implementation strategies or those things that are really important to make sure that these, this growing set of interventions are actually used in community settings, right? If they aren't used in community settings, then in many ways, these interventions are kind of moved. Um, so there's been a lot of work to figure out, you know, what are the strategies or the methods that we need to make sure are in place um, so that people, you know, can feasibly use or per community providers can feasibly use these in community settings. And um, this includes work, again, led by Judy Reven, um, surrounding her facing the fears intervention, thinking about the best training model and, um, and or alternative training models, such as train the trainer. There's been some work um, led by Lauren Brookman Frizzi and Avin Stommer, thinking about um, targeting the leadership within um, community organizations and providing supports and training around how to best integrate new evidence-based practices as a way to then best support the uptake of um, some of these mental health interventions. And then lastly, some of the work I'm um, leading with Jill Locke and others, and I'm and by no means the only people doing this, um, is thinking about what we refer to as multifaceted implementation supports or supports that really target, you know, um, making sure that at the organizational ready, they have all the things that they need, the provider level, um, making sure that they kind of really think through which of these interventions they might want to use um, based on the needs of the providers or the, the clientele that are served um, and using that to inform ultimately the kind of rollout and use of these interventions. There's also been a significant amount of development in service models for mental health, um, including you know, some family navigation models that really focuses on, including the echo autism model that's been um, uh, rolled out uh, at many sites nationally, or there's the um, access to tailored autism integrated care that was led by uh, Nicole Stadden, again at UCSD, um, focused on um, integrating mental health with primary care in primary medical settings as a way to really enhance um, the, perversion, the provision of mental health for autistic individuals. So hopefully you will have seen, there's been a significant amount of advances in terms of our understanding of the needs, uh, mental health needs, the efforts to develop these interventions, as well as efforts to really think thoughtfully about how we go ahead about making sure they get used in community settings. But there's still a significant amount of room for growth or, or areas that we should be going. Um, in this in this field. Um, and this includes the fact that, you know, we need to be thinking about designing um, interventions for community delivery and for use with a range of youth. Um, to date, the majority of the interventions, as I mentioned, as I alluded to, um, have really not been designed for community implementation. And what I mean by that is uh, in the design of them, they haven't considered things like, well, how many um, sessions are actually allowable in a community mental health setting, right? And does my intervention fit with those service caps that are common um, nationwide? Um, are, um, how do these interventions, or might they be used? Um, and um, within the context of, you know, emergent life or emergent things that come up um, within mental health service provision amongst the majority of patients um, that are seen. Similarly, how do these interventions work with the, the realities of what mental health providers are expected to do in their workload and roles in community settings, right? 
Similarly, a large portion of these interventions target one co-occurring condition, which really, you know, given that the majority of autistic individuals don't have just one, on average, many of them have three mental health co-occurring conditions. Um, if you're targeting just one co-occurring um, kind of target area that may not fit with the like clinical needs of um, a, a large portion of autistic individuals as well as the fact that a large portion of these interventions were designed to be implemented with a very limited population um, of autistic individuals that don't represent the, the, the broad spectrum that we know is present. So for example, many of these interventions are highly verbal and require um, a, a higher level of verbal abilities to really benefit or engage in them. Um, and so that leaves a large portion of individuals that don't have, or you, that aren't characterized by having kind of higher verbal ability. So this really calls for thinking about um, or um, making sure that we're designing interventions for community implementation at the outset, as well as you know an emphasis on um, uh, those interventions that are relevant for transdiagnostically, right, uh, or that are relevant for a, a large range of clinical um, presenting problems, and or that fit the kind of needs of the clients that are being served. It's also really important to really think about and make sure that we're strengthening the mental health workforce capacity to deliver and effectively serve autistic individuals. Um, um, uh, there's been a, a good amount of work to characterize, you know, mental health community or community mental health providers um, experience and knowledge working with autistic individuals. Um, and this work has been led by Brenna Maddox and, and Lauren brooklyn Frizee. And overall, unfortunately, this um, the, the results of this work really suggest that um, the majority of the community mental health workforce have very limited autism knowledge, experience, and confidence working with autism. And as a result, it contributes to limited intention to use effective or evidence-based practices for autism. With some of the work led by Brenna Maddox suggesting that many mental health providers um, have stated that they just don't know where to start with autism, right? They don't know how to effectively serve these individuals. There's also the idea that we may need to kind of think about um, shifting the mental health workforce or who's providing the mental health supports, especially given the fact that, you know, many community mental health providers don't have a lot of confidence or knowledge um, to effectively serve. Nationally, there's a, a, sh a mental health shortage of providers. And the fact that there's a really, um, there are a lot of other massive workforces that are interacting or serving autistic individuals, including, for example, you know, a really massive ABA workforce, especially for youth. Um, educational settings are another primary service setting um, interacting with aut autistic individuals. And so, you know, this idea that perhaps we should be really thinking about if we might want to kind of do some shifting of the mental health workforce to make sure that um, the majority of individuals are receiving the mental health supports they need, right? So again, this really points to some key areas of, of making sure that um, we enhance the mental health knowledge and confidence. Um, we think about um, targeting intentions to use amongst mental health providers and, um, and their use of evidence-based practices for autism and shifting the mental health workforce. Additionally, there are some significant concerns regarding the, um, how representative the samples of autistic individuals who've participated in this work developing and testing these mental health interventions has been to date. Um, and um, just to kind of provide some really concrete examples, there's some work here that um, was led by Catherine Picard, one of the fearless leaders of the autism SIG here, um, that suggests that um, within the literature testing CBT for autistic youth, um, there are significant differences between the, the particularly the racial ethnic um, characteristics as well as the educational characteristics of this, this these samples compared to the broader population, suggesting that the kids for whom and, and families for whom we've tested these interventions with, those character their characteristics do not match what we know about the broader kind of national population. We similarly looked at um, the characteristics of the participants who participated in mental health intervention trials to date. And we saw similar findings suggesting that again, the, the, the sample of participants in these intervention trials are largely Caucasian. There's um, largely male, there's very limited um, participation by individuals who identify as female. There's um, limited participation amongst transition age individuals. There's been a predominant focus of many of these 
intervention and intervention trials on um, inter internalizing and externalizing conditions and limited attention paid to things like trauma or OCD. Um, additionally, there's been um, a lot of um, <laughs> inclusionary criteria such that the individual can only present with one co-occurring mental health condition, which as I mentioned, doesn't match the, the typical profile of who's seeking services, particularly mental health services. And then lastly, many of the intervention trials to date have required that participants have a, um, a certain kind of cognitive ability level to participate in these trials. So really excluding a large portion of um, autistic individuals from participating, right? On the flip side of that, we also know that the providers who've been included within these intervention trials are not representative of the mental health workforce. With most of the participants in these studies um, coming from the disciplines of psychology and or being kind of a, a trainee or a PhD, PhD level clinician, which doesn't match the, what we know about you know, who in the community is providing mental health services. So this really points to the need for ensuring that we have an um, we include a representative diverse sample of autistic individuals in the research moving forward. Um, that we really think about focusing on a larger range of mental health conditions beyond things like anxiety and depression. Making sure we aren't excluding and, and have a really a, um, particular focus on trans transition age and adults. Um, and we're you know when we're thinking about testing these interventions, um, we're including a, a a representative sample of who really is delivering mental health services in the community. And then lastly, I think it's really important that we really listen to and incorporate autistic voice into this work, right? Um, there has been, you know, a really documented misalignment between um, the priorities of where re autism research should be going between researchers and then the autistic community, right? Fortunately, I think this is a, an area where um, many individuals are, are kind of um, appropriately collaborating and, and trying to incorporate the, um, the voice and um, opinions of the autistic community in, in their work and helping to use that to guide their research and where things are going. And, um, and this is kind of, um, and this includes work by Teal Benavides that you can see here, really thinking about um, collaborating with, with those folks and trying to understand what their priorities are and then using that to inform ongoing research. Um, and um, I think some of the key priority areas that have been identified that really um, we should be thinking about and moving forward with is um, emphasizing you know, trauma and trauma-informed approaches in terms of mental health interventions. Thinking a little bit more broadly besides these kind of indicated mental health interventions and perhaps kind of um, going to maybe a little bit more of a tier one approach where we think about societal level strategies to enhance inclusion and acceptance for autism. Um, thinking beyond just kind of our traditional intervention models to so thinking about um, additional approaches for to enhance well-being, whether those be um, kind of similar to like a cognitive behavioral model or beyond that, thinking like things like yoga and um, other kind of things that we know can be really effective. I think importantly, um, there's um, we need to be thinking about and evaluating whether or not some of these interventions that we're using and developing and testing have adverse effects, right? This is an area that I think is really important within um, autism, but to date has not been a, a, a largely examined um, thing. And then lastly, and kind of similar to what I um, mentioned in the previous slide, we need to kind of make sure that we're including a range of autistic individuals. Um, a diverse sample of autistic individuals, diverse in terms of race and ethnicity, ability, you name it. I think that's um, a really important thing that we need to focus on. So with that, I am delighted to kind of turn this over and to hear from Micah Peace or Kia um, and their perceptions on, you know, mental health interventions, where we are and where we should be going. So we have a couple of guiding questions that I'm gonna pose for Micah. Um, I'm probably going to stop sharing my screen so that we can really hear from them um, more directly. And then I will um, do my the best that I can to put these um, questions in the chat. So um, to kick us off, I'd really love to hear from you, Micah, as what you see as an area or areas of, um, of where work is needed in terms of mental health interventions for autistic people. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. And um, as you so, so well 
uh, pointed out in your last slide, um, there's definitely more than one. Um, and I, I strongly endorse all of the, the ones that were on that slide, but I think really it all, it begins with um, improve, seeing improvements in the field's ability to really operationalize kind of cultural and linguistic competence. And then the prerequisite of that, which is cultural and linguistic humility. You know, you kind of spoke to the um, sort of very still biased nature of, of autism treatment and stuff that we're, we're dealing with. And even myself have experienced effects from that. Um, I am a non-binary person, but grew up as a girl in the 90s um, and was diagnosed with emotional behavioral disturbance and then everything under the sun uh, because autism was understood to be a white middle to upper class boy condition. Um, and that really sets you up for for a lot of trauma and a lot of uh, ill-fitting, although well attended interventions, right? Um, and and I so we have to begin to understand um, how do I say this? Ah, uh, here so a lot of this comes from the kind of misperception that that this is that science can be completely objective. It can't when it's meeting the lives of, of real people, right? And so any kind of modality or therapy that we provide has to be culturally respectful and responsive to the people who need it. Um, mm -hmm. That is to say, it um, many of the the existing therapies that we have kind of have these these certain social expectations and social norms seated within them that necessarily exclude people of color, necessarily exclude people, of, as you have pointed out repeatedly, of uh, with intellectual disabilities or other uh, disabilities. Um, and and, and uh, autistic people who can't rely on speech to communicate. Um, and, and I think something that often goes kind of misunderstood too about cultural and linguistic humility when it comes to disability is that there is a culture around disability and, and autistic people have a culture um, as well. And delivering therapies in, in ways that are kind of antithetical to how we as autistic people do things and think and and things like that. This is a a, a recipe for, as you mentioned, the unintentioned un, uh, harms uh, that that we don't know enough about in certain modalities yet. Um, I think that another major priority needs to be um, in, in facilitating communication. Um, there is an organization that um, I love called Communication First that is by and for people who can't rely on speech to communicate. And they hold that any person who has been made to go without um, a functional means of communication for even a day uh, should be understood to have complex trauma. Um, and that providing a means of communication, whether it is sign, whether it is simply honoring, uh, pointing and eye gaze and things like that, um, whether it's AAC devices or PECs, um, th that really needs to be the front line mm -hmm. of intervention for people because that is the first step to establishing relationship and beginning to build rapport and understanding. Um, and in my view, it's not possible to, to provide good therapy or to benefit from therapy if you don't understand um, what is going on. Um, and to that end, we also need um, to get a lot better at informed consent and psychoeducation. You talked a little bit about that. Um, but I, uh, a, a part of the study that I, I work on ha was developing, has been developing an instrument to help um, people with autism and other developmental disabilities provide, uh, give their feedback about how they have experienced the mental health services that they've received. Um, 
we adapted it, it from a family instrument uh, so that uh, people, self-advocates could speak directly about their care. And we have seen something really interesting that we have seen, uh, but that I find entirely believable and relatable unfortunately, is that, or believable, I mean, unsurprising, is that a lot of people think that they are in, are receiving mental health services because they are bad or because they are being punished, um, because they have done something wrong. Um, a, not, it is, not the majority, but it is also alarming the amount of people that that don't realize that their providers want to help them, um, and and don't believe that we're bad, um, and that's that's a massive problem. Um, so we have to begin to look at, and you spoke to this really well too, um, to the role of trauma. Uh, that it plays in many of the mental health conditions that we have because we move through a world that is fundamentally not made for us. And many of, and, and the first line of therapy that many people receive is something that is unfortunately oriented kind of toward changing certain aspects of who we are as autistic people. And that's not, you know, uh, because people are, are malintended, um, but that is the reality that we live with. Um, so I think that we need to, to to much better begin kind of from there rather than any certain uh, specific diagnosis. Just understand this is a person who has been through trauma. Thank you for that. Oh, I have a lot of thoughts, but for the sake of time, we're gonna move on to our next question. Then I'm gonna place in the chat. Um, what will you describe as the most important priorities for research on developing and adapting mental health interventions for autistic people? I believe um, we we have to um, move past our kind of overemphasis on childhood uh, and and start to look at um, both what helps autistic adults, but how um, autistic children who have received certain modalities how they fare and are affected by those modalities into adulthood. Um, I also think that um, we need a lot more research that is um, strength-based, that is oriented toward well-being um, rather than reduction of certain symptoms. Um, because I think that a lot of that, um, well, I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't know how to um, that we have in the field, I th it comes from, I think this kind of, it's, it's a fear and frankly, you know, it's ableism. And I don't mean that to, to denigrate anybody or to me, you know, but it's, it's the water that we're all kind of swimming in. Um, and the, and it, it, uh, shows itself in this idea that autistic people are, are profoundly different, um, or are too difficult, um, and and it really um, it has to do more with a, a willingness to to um, meet people in a certain way, in a different way, and not kind of assume that you that every uh, patient that comes into your office is going to be able to that you're going to be able to go into your toolkit of modalities and just apply it. Um, I've been repeatedly misdiagnosed with OCD. Uh, because I'm because autistic people are system thinkers. Um, you know, I don't have any compulsions. I just badly want a, a mental box that I can organize everything in. Um, and so I think that we we need a lot more research that begins to understand autism in, in positive ways and in, in what strengths it has. And, and I mean, to be really frank, we don't have a lot of, of research that tells us what autistic people look like when we're doing well. Um, there's some really interesting research in the UK. I want to say um, Richard Milton is involved in uh, of the double empathy problem. Um, that's what he's most known for. Um, but um, this other research that says like 
all of our diagnostic criteria are oriented around expressions of tremendous stress. Um, we don't identify a child as autistic until they're already presenting uh, with tremendous struggles and in possibly even already mental uh, multiple mental health needs. Um, and that in itself says a lot about the trauma of the way that we're doing things for people. Um, I also think that we need more research on uh, things like expressive therapies. Um, almost everyone in uh, our organization here in Kentucky and Indiana is either um, is, is some sort of artist. Um, um, whether it's music or visual, and I know a lot, a lot of autistic people, um, myself included, who have struggled with certain kinds of therapy, but communicate really well through imagery and um, make comics um, and things like this. Um, myself, uh, theater saved my life because it separated for me the... Um, anxiety of using my own words and learning how to use my own words and speak like someone had written the words so I could focus on how do we act how do I do the social things and all of it was really fun and freeing and building my confidence and so I think um as you said kind of these kind of reimagining what we really think of as providing therapy in certain cases um and therapies with animals. I have I have a pet theory that uh, <laughs> that animal therapy, that things like hippotherapy are really great for autistic people simply because the horse doesn't have an agenda. Um, and I, I agree with you that we need to begin to look at um, ways that we can build capacity of others in our community because a big shortcoming of mental health treatment for autistic folk is that it is solely oriented on the individual when trauma is, trauma almost always occurs in an interpersonal context. Um, and, and so healing must also necessarily occur in an interpersonal context. We have to have opportunities to develop positive identity to develop agency, um, the ability to say no, uh, because this protects us from certain kinds of abuse and exploitation. Um, these kinds of things I think are really critical in building the capacity, not only of providers, but of family members and educators to kind of understand where we are coming from more so that we, because so often autistic people are asked to stretch ourselves to, so that we can be understood by neurotypical people. And it's, it's, it's non-autistic people's turn to do that. Thank you to both Kelsey and Micah. We have a ton of questions in the Q&A, so I'd love to start getting to some of those if we can. Uh, this first one, I'm going to ask Dr. Dixon if you'll start us off, and then Micah, I imagine you'll have some thoughts about this as well. The first question for you is, I would love to hear more about the integration of services for primary care. I work within these settings with patients of all ages. What recommendations do you have? I think even just having the ability either, uh, I understand that sometimes it's hard, you know, the, the clinics that we've run, you know, it's hard to even have someone on site. Um, but the idea that, you know, if, if at the ideal having someone co-located and so that it's not that additional barrier of having to go to a different place that's new, you know what I mean? And, and, and the idea that, um, there's a lot of stigma associated with mental health, even just showing up at a mental health clinic or um, place where they provide mental health services. Um, a lot of that is alleviated when, you know, you can just go to your pediatrician's office and or your primary care's office and receive the services there. I mean, I think that's obviously kind of the ideal, but even all the way down to thinking about how do you more seamlessly integrate referrals, um, connecting to mental health services more directly, 
um, versus like, oh, you have to call this clinic, like ways that you can really um, more seamlessly connect um, the, the medical and the mental health care is another kind of, so it really is a continuum, but I think there's many ways um, to think about that. And um, I'm happy, and I know there's maybe perhaps some requests for um, things of, um, in, of references for this and I'm happy to include some of the work that's been done on this of how they've integrated that in that within that list as well. Yeah. Micah, did you want to comment on that or should we move to the next question? Um, I think Dr. Dixon spoke really well on that. I guess the only thing I would add is, is that at, um, in my work, we call that building linkages and, and thinking about how um, you can foster strategic kind of partnerships with, with, between organizations. Thank you. The next question is specifically for Micah. Uh, there was a request, could you share some examples of incorporating autism culture into therapy? I think you shared some really beautiful examples of ways to think about some alternate therapies like expressive therapies and animal therapies, but I wanted to see if you had thoughts about incorporating autism culture into therapy. All right, uh, I love this question. Um, I think like there's some easy ones like not encouraging eye contact, like uh, having fidgets available in your office, um, uh, looking at the lighting and kind of uh, if you use like white noise or and and talking with your autistic patients about what is most com like what is going to be comfortable for them in the room. I think like. Um, those are some some kind of low hanging fruit. Some some that are more challenging are things like not being afraid to have like difficult conversations or conversations that seem tangential, um, because um, we're bottom up processors. Um, we tend to think about everything and all of the components that make it up and and all of the small details and pieces that that lead to something um whereas you know therapy is often very top down you have um anxiety so we're going to do cbt around this thing um be willing to get to understand the nuances and the certain kinds of things around those um dr dixon mentioned using visuals and being willing to slow down um and even alter your, your path at times. At CASA, one of our ground rules is we have our agenda, but whatever happens today is what needed to happen. Um, and, and that is really important, I think. Um, another one that is really big for me, and, and in general, I'm just gonna go ahead and highly recommend the work of Dr. Devin Price. Um, a social psychologist who wrote Unmasking Autism and recently released Unlearning Shame. Um, and he talks a lot about the importance of values, of, introduce, of introducing people to their values and helping to be grounded in those values because many of us as autistic people, we have a very strong sense of justice and a very strong sense of how things should be. Um, and these, these are those, both of those concepts have everything to do with your values, with your worldview. Um, and so helping autistic people understand those things, uh, because those, many of us can have trouble talking about emotions um, and, and things like that, but values are concrete, they're intellectual, they provide, like for myself, I can be really, really indecisive uh, and and some of it comes from not knowing how I feel or, ha or just generally having a lot of anxiety. And being able to rest on my values helps me to really stay grounded and to know that even when something hasn't gone right for me um, or has been hard, um, that I have done the best that I can and I've stood where I wanted to stand on this. Um, and another thing that I, I really, it's I find it very important to teach people is um, a big part of autism culture is, how do I say this? This is complicated. Um, okay. 
I, as an autistic person, am always, always, always going to have meltdowns. That's not a changeable thing about me. However, it is within my power to recognize my triggers, to recognize the stress that's building up with me. Um, and, and we can do things and I can find uh, support to make them happen less often. So focusing less on the, the things that are, are struggles or are challenging behaviors or whatever, and more on what agency do we have? Um, what supports are available to us? Um, for me, a big one is grocery stores. I have a lot of trouble in the grocery store, but I, but if I have my headphones, uh, my ear defenders, and I have sunglasses and my list, and sometimes another person with me, depending on how I'm doing, I can do it. You know, I'm not going to have a meltdown. Um, but even so, there will always be days when I've done everything I can and the meltdown still comes. And what autistic people need to know is that we're still going to have support after that. People will still like us afterward, that our acceptability is not contingent upon how well we meet neurotypical norms or how comfortable that we make everybody around us. Um, and so the other like biggest piece, I think of, of infusing autistic culture into what you do for me is, is from the beginning working with a person to foster a positive autistic identity. Um, and what I mean by that is, is being very clear with a person that you are autistic, it is part of who you are, and that's fine. We're gonna learn what that means together. It's different for everybody, but it's okay. It's acceptable. And look, there's this support group here in town, or look, we know this um, fabulous self-advocate down at the USAID in our state, and we're gonna connect you. Um, so introducing your your patients and your clients to the the writings and the art and the and the fact that Pokemon was created by an autistic person if they love Pokemon or um, uh, there's a, a basketball player I believe on the Miami Heat who was just diagnosed with autism uh, because his son was like finding these ways to connect. The person in positive ways to like this is a an okay part of who you are it might even be a good thing it's hard right now but but orienting toward the strength and orienting toward the autistic community rather than trying to make a person feel like oh you're normal it's okay like autism is normal and it's okay i love that message micah uh, we're coming up to the end of our time, so I have put a link in the chat and would invite anyone to who has feedback to please share that with us. So that is there. We do have time for one more question, and both uh, Kelsey and Mike have said they have a few extra minutes to stick around if there are extra questions after time is over. This uh, next question is primarily for Dr. Dixon, um, and I'm going to give you two sort of related ones. In prior studies, have they found differences in acceptability or satisfaction from autistic participants in autism-specific versus more general mental health interventions? And related to that, do you think autistic people should be treated by clinical psychologists and psychotherapists or special education experts? Who is the most appropriate uh, expert to deal with autism? Those are great questions. I think the first question, um, uh, you know, interesting, the review that I mentioned that we led where we characterized interventions and adaptation, um, we also characterized the outcomes that people looked at in their, in their work testing these interventions including looking at things like acceptability, appropriateness. Um, and I think thus far, the majority of work to date has not reported on that, the outcome of acceptability, which we know is so critical, right? If you have, if you've developed something that works, that's great. But if I don't like it, I'm not going to use it. Um, and I, that speaks to those, um, what we um, in the field of implementation science call implementation outcomes that are critical to whether this thing actually has legs and it's used. Um, and I think that's an area where they're going. 
But I think that's an area where people need to, you know, if you're, regardless of if you're, you know, what kind of research you're doing, I think that's a key thing you should be measuring and importantly reporting on. I have a feeling that a lot of people get this data and we're just not seeing it in the in in the reporting of the results, right? They just test, does this thing work and have an impact on mental health symptoms, for example, those kind of um, effectiveness or efficacy outcomes. Um, and so that's a question we don't know. I would say anecdotally, of course, you know, um, whether or not you're talking about an intervention that was specifically developed for autism or just an intervention that, you know, it's a it's kind of got patients that's tailored or tailorable and it's got patients at the, the central. Of course, that's going to, people are going to like it better if it allows them, kind of so when Micah says, to be them and it, it accommodates who they are and, 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 and things like that. So I would say, you know, we don't have a ton of data, but I would say, yes, that they are more acceptable when you include some of those considerations and allow for that, you know, individualness. Um, your second question, Allison, can you say it one more time? It, it left my brain. Uh, who is the most appropriate oh, expert the most, to support yeah. autistic people, whether that's clinical psychologists and psychotherapists yeah. versus special educators? Or I, another one. I mean, <laughs> another one. Um, I think that um, I would like to flip that question on its head and say, I don't think we should have a specialist that autistic individuals need to seek out that would be equipped to serve them. I think to Micah's wonderful, wonderful point that we as you know, a neurotypical society should be doing a better job molding ourselves and making ourselves more effective to work with neurodivergent individuals. So I think it could, any of the above, I think we all should be endeavoring to be more effective and knowledgeable and able to work with a diverse range of individuals. So that's my thought. <laughs> Thank you. This next question is for both of you in the few minutes we have left. Do you think there's a problem with existing interventions and in that they don't prioritize the autistic person's mm -hmm. goals, wishes, et cetera, when attending therapy? And Micah, maybe you can start us off on that one mm -hmm. if you have thoughts. Good question. I think, I think so. I think that there is. I think, but I, I, I would also argue that in you know, among certain areas of the field, this may also be kind of true for for uh, other areas of psychotherapy, right? I mean, if we're being really, really honest, um, that um, I think we're still in a moment where where quite generally mental health patients are um, finally getting to have more of a voice and getting to have more agency in the care that's provided and kind of to Dr. Dixon's point on the other question, um, we're, we're still, um, it's just something that we're still beginning to learn for autistic people in the first place for a long time. No one has even been asking the question of, of how do you feel about this? Um, and, and so um, I think that it's, there are certain, uh, modalities that aren't under the purview of psychotherapy uh, that that are showing uh, some pretty consistent research that it is is not only on not honoring uh, autistic children and and people's priorities, but it's it's actively causing them trauma. Um, and and yeah, I think that is something that needs to be addressed. I will say that I just, again, this is my own, what I do as a provider, I, there's the goal, the, the treatment goals that are in the chart that are, you know, tailored to the funding, you know, making sure that these services are covered and funded by whatever funder may be providing them. And that's what maybe is documented in the chart. And then there are the goals that my client and I have for our work together. And they are often not the same, right? <laughs> um, of course we acknowledge those, but like, you know, I've worked with many people that their goal is to, you know, to be able to um, have friends over for a birthday party. And that is our treatment goal. And we work towards that, right? Um, and, you know, we talk a lot about how the skills in this mental health interventions, yes, they will reduce anxiety from a seven to five more days than not. Um, but 
which is the treatment chart goal that's very measurable and objective, but also, you know, them being able to, you know, have um, this feel more comfortable and less anxious inviting people over and things like that, that's going to help them achieve their very personal goal. So I think to that point, I, that's, uh, you know, again, that may not be reflected in the literature and things like that, but as a, a clinician, that's how I handle that is like, there's what's in the chart. And then what I think my client and I really work towards in the day-to-day -day session. Yeah, and I think it really is all about striking that balance and that's kind of mm -hmm. where to go. Well, with that, that takes us to a couple minutes over time and I know several people need to transition to their uh, next activities, including our wonderful speakers. So I wanna again thank Dr. Kelsey Dixon and Micah Pisarkia for sharing their professional expertise and their lived experiences in this work with us today. We have learned so much. This has been so helpful. And thank you to all of you who have come and participated and for sharing your wonderful questions in the chat. We do have uh, in the chat as well as on the screen links where you can uh, share your feedback with us about this and future seminars, as well as information about how you can sign up for our listserv and to join our SIG. Thank you everyone for your time today. And we hope you all have a wonderful afternoon or rest of your day, depending on which time zone you are in.